Sin in Space, Chapter 11. It looked like a bit of sun at first. That was its breaking blast, seen from under. The monster settled swiftly, roaring and flaring in a teasing mathematical progression of successively shorter blasts, more closely spaced. When you could see its silvery bulk in profile, it was going pop, 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 like a machine gun. It settled with a dying splutter and stood on the field some two hundred meters from the crowd like a remembered skyscraper. Trucks raced out to meet it. Inside, the doctor knew, crewmen were walking around capstans that fitted over and unscrewed ten-kilogram hex nuts. The trucks slowed and crawled between the fins, on which the rocket stood, directly under its exhaust nozzle. Drivers cut and filled to precise positions, then platforms jacked up from the crane trucks to receive the rim of the rocket's throat. Men climbed the jacks to fasten them. The captain must have radioed from inside the ship. The last of the first hex nuts was off. Motor away. Slowly the platforms descended, taking the reaction engine with them. The crane trucks crawled off, two ants sharing an enormous burden. The crew inside was busy again, dismantling fuel tanks, while the trucks moved to inspection and repair shut off the field. A boom lifted off the motor, and the drivers scuttled back to receive the first installment of the fuel tanks, the second, the third, and the last. "'Now do the people come out?' asked Tad. "'If the rocket hasn't got any more plumbing, they do,' Tony told him. "'Yes, here we go.' Down between the fins descended a simple elevator, the cargo hoist letting down a swaying railed platform on a cable. It was jammed with people. The waiting port officer waved them toward the administration building. The crowd, which had overflowed gently past the broad white line on the field, drifted that way, too. "'Stanchions! Get stanchions out!' the port officer yelled. Two field workers broke out posts in a rope that railed off the crowd from the successive hoist loads of people herded into the administration building for processing. There was a big murmur at the third load. Graham! The doctor was too far back to get a good look at the great man. The loudspeaker on top of the building began to talk in a brassy rasp. Brenner Pharmaceuticals, Baroda, Schwartz, Hopkins, W. Smith, Avery for Brenner Pharmaceuticals, it said. Brenner ducked under the rope to meet five men issuing from the building. He led them off the field, talking earnestly and with gestures. Pitco! Miss Kearns for Pitco 3! A pretty girl stepped through the door and looked about helplessly. A squat woman strode through the crowd, took the girl by the arm, and led her off. Radio Minerals Corporation got six replacements. Distillery Mars got a chemist and two laborers. Metro Films got a cameraman who would stay with a pair of actors who would be filmed against authentic backgrounds and leave next week with the prince. A squad of soldiers, headed by a corporal, appeared, and some of the field workers let out a cheer. They were next for rotation. Brenner got two more men. Kelly's Coffee Bar got Mrs. Kelly, bulging with bricks of coffee and sugar. Sun Lake City Colony, said the loudspeaker. W. Jenkins, A. Jenkins, R. Jenkins, L. Jenkins, for Sun Lake. Watch the box, Tony called to Tad as he strode off. He picked up the identification and authorization slips waiting for him at the front desk inside and examined them curiously. Good, he thought. A family with kids. The loudspeaker was now running continuously. Two more for Chabrier, three engineers for Pitco headquarters in Marsport. A uniformed stewardess came up to him. Dr. Hellman, from Sun Lake? Her voice was professionally melodious. He nodded. These are Mr. and Mrs. Jenkins. She turned to the family group behind her. And Bobby and Louise Jenkins, she added, smiling. The kids were about seven and four-year-olds, respectively. Tony smiled down at them, shook hands with their parents, and presented his authorizations to the stewardess. Prentice, Skelly, and Zaretsky for Sun Lake, the loudspeaker called. "'Excuse me, I'll be right back,' Tony said, and headed back to the desk. They gave him more authorization slips. He rifled through the papers quickly as he headed back to find the Jenkinses had waited for the newcomers. All different names, only one family, the rest singles. Too bad. He hunted through his pockets and found two packets of peanuts, matted beyond recognition into chewy objects with the flavor of something like grape pop. By the time Bobby and Lou had overcome their shyness enough to accept the gifts, another stewardess was bringing up the rest of the group destined for Sun Lake. Dr. Hellman? Her voice was as much like the first stewardess as her uniform, but according to ancient custom, this one was blonde and the other a brunette. Miss Skelly, Miss Giotano, Mr. Graham, Mr. Apprentice, Mr. Bond, Mr. Zaretsky, she said, and vanished. 
Tony nodded and shook hands all around. Let's get out of here, he said. It's quieter outside, and I have to give you all a physical checkup, so... Again? One of the men groaned. We just had one on board. I think I've had a million different shots since I started all this, the other girl put in. What was her name? Daltano? Do we get more needles? I'm afraid so. We have to be careful, you know. Someday he would meet a rocket, and nobody but nobody would make that particular remark. Or perhaps that was too much to hope for. Let's get out of here, Tony said again. He offered his hands to the children, and they started. By the time they reached Tad and the box that held the portable health lab, the crowd was already thinning out. We'll get right to it, the doctor addressed his group. I'm sorry I can't examine you indoors under more comfortable circumstances, but I have to make a quick check before we can even let you board the ship. It won't take long if we start right away. Doesn't the port have facilities for this sort of thing? Someone asked. Sure. They've got a beautiful setup right inside the ad building. Anybody can use it. Sun Lake can't afford the price. He called them up one at a time, starting with the Jenkinses, parents, and then children, so the kids wouldn't have too much time to get apprehensive about the needles. His trained reflexes went through the business of blood and sputum tests, ear, eye, nose, throat, fluoroscopy, nervous and mental, while he concentrated on getting acquainted. Names began to attach themselves to faces. He finished with the two single girls, and then on to the men. The big, red-faced one was Zarensky. Skinny little bookkeeper type was Prentice. The talkative one was Graham. First name? Tony was filling in the reports while the samples went through analysis. Douglas. Drop in or shares? Drop in, I guess. On Earth, we call it the working press. Press? Tony looked up sharply. The Douglas Graham. The this is, ma'am. Didn't you know I was coming out? Tony hesitated, and Graham asked quickly, Your place is open to the press, isn't it? Oh, sure. We just... Well, frankly, we didn't think you'd bother with us. Certainly didn't think you'd come to us first. We'd have rolled out the red carpet. He grinned and pointed to the array of planes at the other end of the field. For the first time, he became aware of the curious and envious stares their small group was receiving from passerby. Everybody else did. I guess we were about the only outfit on Mars that didn't at least hope to bring you back home today. He turned his attention to the checkup form. Age? Thirty-two. From appearance and general condition, Tony would have given the journalist ten more years. It was a shock to find that they were both the same age. He finished without further comment and went on to the next and last, a lanky blonde youth named Bond. By the time he was done, the analysis and reaction tests were complete. The doctor checked them over carefully. You're all right, he announced to the group at large. We can get started now. It was a slow trip. None of the newcomers were accustomed to the low gravity. They were wearing heavy training boots acquired on board the rocket and all of them were determined to see everything that was to be seen in Marsport before they took off. Tony led them across the spaceport field and down the main street of Marsport, a mighty boulevard whose total length was something under 500 yards, the distance from the spaceport to the landing strip. He answered eager questions about the ownership and management of the hotels and office buildings that lined the block adjacent to the spaceport. These were mostly privately owned and privately built, constructed of glass, brick, the native product had a sparkling, multicolored sheen that created a fine illusion of wealth and high fashion, even when you knew that no building made of the stuff could possibly stand more than ten years. The same, slightly different chemical content of Martian potash that produced the lustrous coloration of the bricks made them particularly susceptible to the damaging effects of wind and sand. Glass brick construction was by far more costly than the rammed earth buildings at Sun Lake or the scrap shanties that characterized the Pitco camp across the Rimrock Hills from the colony, but it was still much less expensive than the earth import steel and aluminum alloy used wherever strength and durability were important. The administration building of the Planetary Affairs Commission, which occupied one entire side of the center block, was sheathed in a muted green alum alloy. The PAC stores and official PAC hotel across the street were respectively dull rose and dove gray. The doctor pointed out each building in turn to his wide-eyed group. The writer was as eager as any of the others, and asked as many questions. Tony was surprised. He's anticipated a bored sophistication. Graham responded equally unpredictably to the series of interruptions they met, 
with en route. Shabrir was first, even before they'd left the spaceport. He dashed up to pump Tony's hand and babbled that he was delighted to see him again, and how well Tony looked despite his drab sojourn to the so dull Sun Lake where nothing ever happened. "'But this is Mr. Graham, isn't it?' he exclaimed in delight. "'Yeah,' said the writer dryly. "'How fortunate! Distillery Mars, my concern, small but interesting, happens to be preparing a new run of Mars liquor, 120 proof. We should be so honored if you could make a point of sampling our little effort, shall we say, this afternoon? I have comfortable—' A sidelong glance at Tony. "'Transportation here. Maybe later.' To a connoisseur of your eminence, of course, we should think it a privilege to offer you an honorarium. Maybe later, maybe not, grunted the writer. Chabrier only shrugged and smiled, but Gunther could say no wrong. You'll perhaps be pleased to accept a small sample of product of Mars Distillery. The little man held up a gaudily wrapped package. He pressed the gift into Graham's indifferent grasp, wrung Tony's hand warmly and heartily, said, We will look forward to seeing you soon, and departed. Halliday of Mars Machine Tool was next. His manner was more that of a man inviting a guest to his country club, but he did mention that MMT would, of course, expect to provide for a writer's necessary expenses. Graham cut off Halliday's bluff assurances as curtly as he stopped Shabrier's outpourings. It was like that all the way. Everybody who was anybody on Mars was in town that day, and each of them managed to happen on the Sun Lake crowd somewhere along the road from the spaceport to the landing strip. Those who met Tony at any time in the past were all determined to stop him for a chat. Then they noticed Graham and extended a coincidental but warm invitation. Those who were unacquainted with Sun Lake's doctor were forced to be more direct, and the bribe was sometimes even more marked than Shabrir or Holiday's offers. Graham was cold and even nasty to them, but once he took Tony's arm and said, Wait, I see an old friend. Commissioner Bell was up ahead, striding toward the administration building. Hey, Commish! Bell stopped as if he'd been shot. He turned slowly toward Graham and stood his ground as the writer approached. When he spoke, there was a cold hatred in his voice. "'Just the company that I'd expect you to keep, Graham. Stay out of trouble. I'm the man in charge here, and don't think I'm afraid of you.' "'You weren't last time,' said Graham. "'That was your big mistake. Commish.' Bell walked away without another word. "'You shot his blood pressure up about twenty millimeters,' said Tony." What's it all about? I claim a little credit for sending Bell to Mars, Doc. I caught him with his fingers in the till. A wild hope flared in Tony that this is man was sporadically known as a crusader. Perhaps Graham's annoyance at the crude plays for attention meant an appeal could be made on the basis of decency and fair play. By the time they reached the plane, Tad was already on the spot with the portable health lab stowed away, and B was warming up the motors. Hi! She stuck her head out of the cockpit to grin at Tony. Got everybody? Tad, hand out the parkas to those people. Tony, they tell me you're a hero. Had it out with Big Bad Brenner in real style. She didn't quite say I never thought you had it in you. Things get around, don't they? B, this is Douglas Graham. He's coming out to have a look at Sun Lake for a book he's doing. This is B. Juarez, he told the writer. She's our pilot. Graham surveyed B. I hope everything in the colony looks as good. We'll be extra careful to show you only the best, she retorted. Hey, Tad, get that mink-lined parka, will you? We got a guest to impress. Tony was delighted. If everyone else in the colony could take the great man in stride so easily, he would be pleased and very much surprised. Tad came running up with a parka. What kind did you say you wanted? This is the only one left, except Dr. Tony's. The three adults burst into laughter, and Tad retreated, red-faced. Graham called him back. I'm going to need that thing if the temperature in the cockpit doesn't go up. You're going to need it anyhow, Tony assured him. There's a lot to be said for Lazy Girl here, but she's not 100% airtight. I get the idea, the journalist assured him. You people don't throw heat around, do you? Not heat or anything else, Tony replied. You'll see, if you can stick it out. What the hell, I was a war correspondent in Asia. This isn't a war. There isn't anything exciting to make up for the discomfort except, say, when a baby gets born. No? I take it there was something going on just a little while ago. What were you saying about the doctor being a hero? He called forward to B. She shrugged. All I know is what I hear on the grapevine. Tony heaved a mental sigh of relief. Too soon. I was there! Tad had stuck right by them. 
This man, Mr. Brenner, came over and asked Dr. Tony to come work for him, and he wouldn't, and he tried to get him with a whole lot of money, and he still wouldn't, and... Hold on, Graham interrupted. First thing you have to learn if you're going to be a reporter is to get your pronouns straight. This Brenner was doing the offering, and Doc was refusing. That right? Sure, that was what I was saying. Look, Tad, we were only kidding about impressing Mr. Graham, Tony said quickly. You don't have to make a hero out of me. I just had a disagreement with someone, he said to Graham. And they're trying to make a good story out of it. That's what I'm after, Graham came back. A good story. Tell me everything that happened, Tad. The boy looked doubtfully from the doctor to the guest and back again. All right, Tony gave in. But let's not make a fifteen-round fight out of it, Tad. Tell it just the way it happened, if you've got to tell it. Just exactly? Yes, the doctor said firmly. Just the way it happened. Okay. Tad was far from disappointed. If anything, he was gleeful. So this Mr. Brenner wanted Tony to come work at his place, curing people from drugs, and he wouldn't, and Mr. Brenner kept pestering him till he got mad, and he said he didn't like him and wouldn't work for him no matter what. I mean, Dr. Tony said that to Mr. Brenner, and Mr. Brenner got real mad and started to swing at him, and... Well, don't stop now, Graham said. Who won? Well, then Mr. Brenner started swinging, and I stuck my foot out and tripped him, and Mr. Shabrier came right over right away and said how wonderful it was the way Dr. Tony had socked Mr. Brenner, and I guess that's what everybody thought. <laughs>